Let's wait one one moment. Until no worries. One. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to this future oral session four. Uh, we have uh, Scott Rich, who is a postdoctoral researcher, a fellow at the Kremlin Brain Institute in Toronto, Western Hospital of Canada. His uh, lines of work are related to synchronization in neuronal circuits and networks, in particular applied to epileptic seizures. So the talk of today would be lost uh, neuronal heterogeneity in human epileptic. Epilepsy is a fundamental principle unifying epileptic etiology. Thank you very much, Scott, for being here. Awesome. Thank you very much for uh, for the honor of this uh, featured presentation. I'm really excited to present this work, um, which is a, a very interdisciplinary effort that's uh, across both myself, uh, Homera Marati Chame, who is elect an electrophysiologist extraordinaire, uh, Jeremy Lefebvre, who is one of my co-supervisors and a more mathematically minded neuroscientist, and uh, Taufik Valiente, who is another one of my supervisors and is a clinician scientist. And as you mentioned, the focus of this talk and of my work is epilepsy. And one of the reasons we're interested in this is that it is the most common serious neurological disorder in the world. For those who aren't familiar, epilepsy is characterized by recurrent seizures, seizures being a hyperactive and hypersynchronous brain state that start in a localized region of the brain and then propagate throughout the brain, engulfing the entirety of the brain. And this is what leads to the debilitating physical symptoms of seizures that you're probably familiar with. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting about this disease is that it's been characterized going back to quite literally the dawn of modern medicine with the ancient Greeks and Hippocrates. And partially because of that, we've had fairly effective pharmacological interventions for this disease dating back more than a century. But what's interesting about these pharmacological treatments is that there seems to be a pretty hard ceiling for how efficacious they are. They only tend to work for about two thirds of patients with epilepsy. The remainder are classified as having medically refractory epilepsy. So when we dig into these pharmacological treatments, what we find is that they arise from, some, from this hypothesis that seizures arise from excess excitation. This makes intuitive sense considering that seizure is a hyperactive brain state. So these pharmacological treatments tend to act in one of two ways, either by increasing inhibitory signaling via the neurotransmitter GABA or decreasing excitatory signaling by blocking the neurotransmitter glutamate. But again, the fact that there's this hard ceiling of the efficacy of these pharmacological interventions implies that this hypothesis doesn't encompass the entirety of epilepsy. It doesn't encompass the entirety of all the different pathways to seizures. And if we want to design new pharmacological or other treatments for these medically refractory patients, we need new hypotheses underlying both epilepsy, the disease, and seizure, the phenomenon. Now, one of the features of seizures that is uh, you know, less classical, but has been the focus of more recent research, particularly computational research, is that the seizure, a seizure is an information poor state. This hypersynchronous activity is very is poor for uh, for information coding. Now, in parallel to that, there's been developing literature showing that biophysical heterogeneity is a preserved feature throughout the body, throughout biophysical systems, but specifically in the brain as well. And in the brain, it's known to promote information coding. So the fact that heterogeneity promotes information coding and seizure is an information poor state implies that there may be some relationship between the onset of seizure and the loss of biophysical heterogeneity. Now, there's a wide range of sources of biophysical heterogeneity in the brain. Uh, there's diversity in neuronal cell types. There's been a ton of great uh, posters at this conference about the diversity in interneurons. There's also diversity within similarly classified cell types in terms of biophysical properties. And then finally, there's always diversity in the inputs to particular units in any neural circuit or neural system, given uh, the relative sparseness of synaptic connectivity. What we realized when we tried to sort of piece these two things together is that the seemingly disparate causes of epilepsy can actually be recontextualized as losses in biophysical heterogeneity. So for instance, certain types of epilepsy come about due to the loss of specific cell types, 
uh, the SOM somatostatin expressing inner neurons are implicated in this. There are certain types of epilepsies that arise due to the selective loss of these neurons. There's also certain types of epilepsies that come about due to the misexpression of ion channels, which can yield homogenization of intrinsic properties of neurons. For me, the most illustrative example of this is the H channel, uh, something that's been talked a lot about in this conference. Something that's really interesting in epilepsy is that both the underexpression and overexpression of the H channel can lead to different types of epilepsies. And while this may seem co contradictory, you can reconcile this, uh, the, this contradiction through the idea that both this over and under expression can homogenize intrinsic properties in these neurons. Finally, it's known that seizures, particularly those brought about by traumatic brain injury, are associated with synaptic sprouting. The additional synapses brought about by synaptic sprouting can be thought of as homogenizing the inputs to the system. So taken together, this allows us to hypothesize that epileptogenesis can be recontextualized as a process where a reduction in biophysical heterogeneity renders neural circuits less resilient to seizure onset. And as I mentioned, there is, you know, bits and pieces of evidence in the existing literature that can be contextualized as support for this hypothesis, but it's something that's never been directly studied. And because it's never been directly studied, we wanted to approach this problem using a wide range of interdisciplinary tools. And this sort of experimental computational theoretical cycle, which is something that's motivated a lot of the research that we've highlighted at this conference so far, is how I'm gonna organize the presentation of this talk. We're gonna start with the uh, biophysical reality, the experimental reality. Uh, I'm very lucky that I have access to data taken from live human cortical tissue. Uh, this is facilitated by Dr. Valiente's status as a clinician scientist. He is the one performing receptive surgeries for patients with epilepsy. He directly takes this live cortical tissue. It goes directly to the lab where Dr. Maradi Chame is able to do patch clamp recordings on these individual neurons. It's worth emphasizing that we're really lucky at Kremble and Toronto Western Hospital to have access to this data. Very few labs in the world are able to do recordings from individual human neurons with this level of precision. Uh, this unique data then constrains my computational modeling. I'll go into the details of our network uh, later on. In turn, we're able to, uh, to further probe these networks using tools from mathematical analysis. Uh, this is something where uh, my other supervisor, Dr. Lefebvre's expertise as a more mathematically minded neuroscientist is particularly useful. And then finally, I'm going to conclude my talk by sort of completing this loop by showing how we can actually explain some very surprising experimental results using the theory that we generate in this process. Now, to start off with this experimental ground truth, the background to this research is our characterization of, quote, seemingly normal human cortical neurons. I use that terminology, seemingly normal, very purposefully. Uh, all of this tissue is taken from patients with epilepsy. Uh, the reason being obvious ethical concerns, we can only do surgery on humans when there is a medical need to do so. Uh, it is the convention in the field of human electrophysiology that tissue taken from the non-epileptogenic region far away from the seizure generating zone is deemed healthy enough or seemingly normal to be classified and studied as indicative of the healthy brain. And we recently published a uh, study in Nature Communications that goes into these properties of pyramidal cells throughout the cortex. One of the interesting things we found in this study was notable heterogeneity in passive properties, even amongst similarly classified neurons. So if you look at these layer five cells, there's about a 30 millivolt spread in their resting membrane potential. This is something that was somewhat surprising, especially relative to the existing rodent, li existing rodent literature, but it's actually borne out by the other uh, electrophysiological studies of human cortical neurons that exist. And I'll mention here that as a sort of spin out of this huge project, we were also able to develop a multi-compartment biophysically detailed model of a human cortical pyramidal neuron uh, with a specific focus on the H current. Uh, and we identified how the H current is actually very different in human neurons as opposed to rodent neurons. 
if you're at all interested in using a more human motivated model in your research, uh, this might be a great place to start. Now, out of this study in our characterization of these seemingly normal neurons, we wanted to compare this to unhealthy neurons that are more indicative of the situation of patients with epilepsy. To do so, we looked at three different sources of pyramidal neurons. The first is non-epileptogenic temporal lobe tissue taken from patients with epilepsy. This is the type of tissue that we use to, in this Nature Communications paper. We contrast that with epileptogenic tissue taken from the frontal lobe. This is epileptogenic tissue because it's taken directly from the seizure generating zone that's identified via uh, prior to surgery. And then finally, we had an additional control where we looked at non-epileptogenic tissue from the frontal lobe, this time from patients undergoing tumor resection rather than undergoing surgery for epilepsy. And again, we use this as a control to show that the results we find are not confounded by the different brain regions in which we're able to obtain tissue from our patients with epilepsy. Now, what do we find when we experimentally characterize this tissue? Well, we're primarily interested in excitability, considering that epilepsy is thought as a disease of excitability. And so we characterized a very simple distance to threshold measure, which is just the neurons threshold potential and resting membrane potential subtracted. And what we found in our three different regions is a significantly lower coefficient of variation in this distance of threshold measure in our epileptogenic population when compared to either of our non-epileptogenic populations. This shows that there is a significant decrease in variability or heterogeneity in this measure, in this epileptogenic population, and that this isn't confounded by the cortical region, considering we still see this difference when comparing uh, frontal epileptogenic tissue from frontal tissue taken from tumor patients. And these differences can probably be more easily appreciated in these Gaussian fits to the data. There's this higher peak in the red epileptogenic curve. Now moving forward, when I start talking about our math and our models, I'm gonna start talking about sigma, which is a standard deviation in these, this distance of threshold measurement, sigma E referring to our excitatory pyramidal neurons. When we look at just the standard deviation of these distance of threshold values, we find that they are significantly different between our frontal epileptogenic and temporal non-epileptogenic regions. So these are the values for either unhealthy epileptogenic low heterogeneity versus healthy non-epileptogenic uh, high heterogeneity cases that we're going to use throughout the remainder of this work. Now, what we wanted to create a mathematical uh, computational system in which we could directly implement and control these heterogeneity values. We created a spiking EI network of Poisson neurons in which we could control this heterogeneity. For those who aren't familiar, these Poisson neurons are a stochastic process in which you implement a uh, activation function. In this case, our activation function is uh, a, of a sigmoidal shape. And then at each time step, we use a Poisson process to determine whether a spike occurs or not based upon the sort of input probability generated by this function f. Now, part of this function f is this term h, which we call the real base. Note that this is not the biophysical real base. This is just a, a sort of uh, artifact of some differences between the mathematical modeling terminology and the electrophysiological terminology. This is just sort of a shift in terms of this activation function. And it's analogous to the distance of threshold and is also normally distributed with a standard deviation of either sigma E or sigma I, depending upon the population. So you can see here how our real base distributions for our high heterogeneity case are wider. For the low heterogeneity case, it's much narrower. And what this HJ term does is shift these fainter sigmoids left and right. These fainter sigmoids in the background are the individual neuron sigmoids. The bolded sigmoids are population averages, which we'll talk more about later in the talk. I'll also mention this uh, gray box later in the talk. It is there for a reason. It's a little bit of a uh, foreshadowing here on my part. But again, the idea here is that larger values of HJ shift 
these sigmoids to the right, essentially meaning that you need more input in order for the corresponding neuron to spike. That's akin to having a higher than average distance to threshold. And correspondingly, when these HJs are low, you're shifting the curve to the left. You're requiring that the neuron, the neuron requires less input in order to spike. That's akin to having a lower than average distance to threshold. So you can think of this Rio base is basically just a mapping of our distance to threshold where we take our average distance to threshold and sort of map it to zero. So we have this sort of classical normal distribution that makes more sense for future mathematical analysis. Now this is an EI network. So we have both inter and intra connectivity between our excitatory and inhibitory populations. A couple of things of note here is that there are differences between these two populations, uh, both on their time constants as implied by experimental literature, as well as in the tonic bias current that sort of biases their baseline activity levels. And I'll finally note that there is noise in the system. There's an independent noisy input to each neuron. This noise is scaled endogenous to the system dynamics. So while it's there and it's participating, it isn't driving network dynamics. This is not a noise driven system. I'll note our synaptic weights, as you might expect from an EI network, the EI and IE connectivities are much stronger than the EE and II connectivities. If you've seen a Poisson neuron before, you might look at these synaptic weights and say, whoa, those are really large. The reason they're really large is this choice of our nonlinear gain term, beta, which affects our activation function a little left, that sigmoid. We chose this value of beta so that the heterogeneity levels made sense with millivolt scale so that we could directly implement a sigma of 4.4 millivolts or 7.8 millivolts and yield dynamics that make sense. Uh, so again, this is basically just a rescaling of a more traditional Poisson neuron, and that rescaling has to be reflected in all the other terms, including our synaptic weights. And for more details on that process, uh, you can read the methods section on our bioarchive paper. Now, what do we see when we start investigating these networks? So what I'm showing you here first is the case of a healthy system that has both high levels of excitatory and inhibitory heterogeneity. You're seeing a raster plot in the background here. In the foreground, you have uh, quantifications of the network dynamics in 500 millisecond moving time windows, a synchrony measure here in blue, a uh, measure of the average excitatory firing rate in black, and the average inhibitory firing rate in, in gray. And what we're doing, our sort of default experimental setting, is a slowly increasing uh, drive to the system. And what we see is that all of these measures seem to scale linearly with the drive to the system. There aren't many major notable changes in network dynamics. Contrast that to the case where we have low heterogeneity, both in our excitatory and inhibitory populations. Now we see this very sudden onset of very synchronous dynamics that corresponds with a sudden uptick in the excitability of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. This is what we deem as the onset of seizure-like activity. Note that I'm focusing on seizure onset. We're not making any claims about whether this models a seizure that sort of goes beyond the scope of this work and the sort of the simple Poisson neuron model that we chose for future mathematical analysis. We're focusing on the onset of seizure-like activity and again, because seizure is a hyperactive, hypersynchronous state, this uh, is a reasonable approximation for that onset. Now, obviously, I'm not going to convince you of anything by showing you plots from one run of these networks. So let's look at some averages. So now we're taking our measures and averaging them over 10 independent simulations. These fainter curves represent plus or minus uh, one standard deviation. What you see in the high heterogeneity case is that this behavior is still very stereotyped. We see this sort of linear increase in the synchrony as a function of the external drive. If you were to think about what's going on from a population level uh, behavior measure, something you know, akin roughly to an LFP, you would see this, you know, not many changes in the dynamics of the network beyond maybe a slight increase in activity. 
Contrast that again with the low heterogeneity case where we see this very sudden uptick in synchrony and activity. We note that this, uh, the timing at which, or the drive level, excuse me, at which this uptick occurs is again, highly stereotyped. You can see how tight the standard deviation window is here. And what this would look like in some sort of population level measure is the sudden onset of high amplitude oscillatory dynamics. Now, what I've mentioned here is if you take a very critical eye, probably at worst anecdotal evidence that this lost heterogeneity makes the system more vulnerable to seizure onset. If I wanna strengthen this and make a potential causal argument, this is where the mathematical analysis comes into play. So we're gonna take our spiking network and reduce it via mean field analysis. I won't go into the major details here, but it follows along the lines of recent work uh, by myself and Dr. Lefebvre. And what this yields is a much simpler two dimension or system of two ODEs, one uh, term measuring the mean excitatory activity, one the mean inhibitory activity. The main difference here is that instead of considering little f's for each individual neuron, we're now considering big f's, which are the averaged activation function over the entire population. So again, this is essentially just averaging together all of these background sigmoids into these bolder sigmoids in the foreground. The major difference being this blue curve, which is the high heterogeneity curve, looks flatter, it looks a little bit more linear towards the middle, in contrast to the much clearer S sigmoid shape for the low heterogeneity curve. Again, foreshadowing a bit here, that's gonna be very important towards the end of this talk. With these tools in hand, we're able to go to town with our dynamical systems analysis. We can find fixed points. We can then linearize the system and find the stability of the fixed points by finding the eigenvalues of the linearized system. And what we're gonna do is do this numerically because the fact that F is a convolution, it makes finding an analytical an analytical solution quite difficult. So we've solved these things numerically. And we're gonna do this for each level of this external drive that we looked at in our spiking networks previously. So we're gonna maintain that correspondence between our spiking network simulations and our mathematical analysis. Now what we find is that in the high heterogeneity case, we only ever get a single fixed point which we can classify as a stable oscillator, considering it has an imaginary eigenvalue with negative real part. The fact that we have a single type of fixed point makes sense considering we don't see any major changes in network behavior. Again, this is highly contrasted with what we see with low heterogeneity. First of all, we see multiple fixed points for low values of the external drive. Uh, the saddle and the sink collide and disappear leaving only the unstable oscillator, a fixed point with, again, a imaginary eigenvalue, now with positive real component. This colliding of the saddle and the sink indicates that we're undergoing a saddle node bifurcation. And what's really interesting is that the value of the drive at which this saddle node bifurcation occurs corresponds almost identically with where this transition into hypersynchronous behavior happens in our spiking networks. So this clear correspondence between the mathematical system and the computational simulation allows us to strengthen this causal argument. It allows us to say that decreasing the heterogeneity leads to the saddle node bifurcation. Again, the only thing we changed in these analyses were the values of sigma E and sigma I. The existence of that saddle node bifurcation is, seems to be causal for this sudden change in synchrony that we deem our onset of seizure-like activity. Now, we wanted to see that this was more robust to varying values of sigma E and sigma I. For our spiking networks, we created what we called a bifurcation measure. Essentially what this measure does is detect whether sudden changes in synchrony occurred by smoothing the synchrony measure time series, calculating the difference quotient at each time step, and then calculating the variance of these difference quotients. In the case where this is linear, you're basically gonna see very similar difference quotients and low variance. When there are multiple components of this time series, you're gonna see 
a multimodal distribution of those difference quotients leading to higher variance. Now, this bold border you see on the heat map demarcates systems that are multi-stable from those that are sing have single fixed points in our mathematical system. So again, this bottom left regime is multi-stable. The remainder of the heat map has a single fixed point. So what you can appreciate from this visualization is that there's this asymmetric effect of sigma i versus sigma e on both the bifurcation measure and on where this multi-stability occurs. This is a little bit more easily appreciable when we look at a slightly simpler experimental setup. Now we just give a tonic drive to the system, measure the network synchrony, and then look at whether the fixed point is either unstable in this bottom left or stable in the remainder. And again, you see this really nice correspondence between the regime of the highest synchrony indicative of epileptic-like behavior and this regime of unstable fixed points, which we saw in the low heterogeneity uh, exemplar case. This asymmetry makes some sort of sense when you consider that there is in all likelihood higher heterogeneity amongst the population of interneurons, considering how diverse the subpopulations of interneurons are. So what this suggests is one, that neural circuits can probably tolerate less lost heterogeneity amongst inhibitory cells as opposed to excitatory cells. The fact that this transition occurs at a higher value of sigma i. And also that preserving inhibitory heterogeneity might be a bulwark against the effects of lost excitatory heterogeneity. The fact that at this high value of sigma i, you always see very low synchrony. So taken together, this is support for our hypothesis that epilepsy can be recontextualized as a progressive loss of biophysical heterogeneity. We've shown that this exists experimentally in human epilepsy. We've shown computationally that the experimentally seen changes in heterogeneity yield dynamical changes associated with seizure onset. And then we use mathematical analysis to give a fundamental explanation for how heterogeneity affects the dynamics in the system's underlying mathematical architecture. Now here's the really cool sort of, you know, kicker to the story that finishes off that experimental theoretical loop. When we characterized our neurons, our neurons, we also looked at their excitability via an FI curve, repetitive firing frequency on the y-axis, tonic input current on the x-axis. We were really, really surprised to find that our epileptogenic neurons were less excitable than their non-epileptogenic counterparts, oftentimes significantly so. This is really counterintuitive when you remember that epilepsy is typically thought of as a disease of hyperexcitability, but our single neurons didn't seem to be hyperexcitable. This confused us for a long time until we took a look back at this mathematical characterization of our neural populations and what we remembered is that these average FI curves, these bolded curves, show this type of dynamic. The, not, the healthy, non-epileptogenic, high heterogeneity population is more linear and shows this higher activity level early in the sigmoid in the region that corresponds with the FI curve. And lo and behold, I can just plop that FI curve onto this curve and see this remarkable correspondence between the experimental data and the effects of heterogeneity that we characterize mathematically. To strengthen this, we, can, we show this experimental data directly against that portion of the curve, that gray box. We, and we also perform the best fit to this data. And we found really nice correspondence between the values of sigma that, may, that give us the non-epileptogenic and the epileptogenic data. What this shows is that the linearizing effect of heterogeneity explains the counterintuitive hypoexcitability of our epileptogenic, less heterogeneous population. And what's interesting about this is that it leads us to the idea that increased network excitability, a la the type we see in seizure, can potentially arise independently of hyperexcitability of individual neurons. We can get hyperexcitable network dynamics without hyperexcitable single unit dynamics. In fact, you know, counterintuitively, less excitable single unit dynamics 
can lead to hyper excitable network dynamics. So this is a really cool result that sort of highlights the complexity and the nonlinearity of neural networks, which is the reason why we're all here and doing computational neuroscience. Now, the end goal of this work and all of our work in the lab is to help patients with epilepsy and potentially uncover new treatment regimes or paradigms for these medically refractory patients. Uh, part of our ongoing work is trying to separate out the effects of heterogeneity and the effects of this FI curve. We're doing so by creating new neural models that are a little bit more biophysically detailed through which we can disentangle these influences. We also wanna translate our findings to the clinic uh, and we potentially design ways in which we can add heterogeneity back to the system. Uh, uh, this was the subject of a theoretical paper that we recently published in Scientific Reports. And then finally, we, we think that one way that which we could do this is the use of closed loop neuromodulation and neurostimulation. And a, a really exciting uh, new element of our work is that we've spun out a company called NerveX from the Valiente Lab that's specifically targeted at deploying these implantable devices to design new treatments for epilepsy. And this is driven, of course, by Dr. Valiente, as well as Gerardo O'Leary, who is assumed to be PhD uh, from the electrical engineering side of the lab. So with that, um, I wanna say thank you again for the opportunity to present this work. I wanna thank uh, Drs. Valiente and Lefebvre, uh, also Dr. Skinner, who is another one of my supervisors, not involved with this work as much, um, but I'm really lucky to have three supervisors who have a diverse range of interdisciplinary skill sets. Uh, Dr. Maradi Chame is, I would argue, the greatest patch clamp electrophysiologist in the world. I'm so lucky to get to work with her and get to use uh, her amazing data. And then finally, our funding sources. And obviously, I will take all your questions now, but I'll mention that I'll be active on uh, the Discord channel, uh, FO4. And then uh, you can also reach out to me via Twitter uh, if you have any questions or want to discuss this work any further. OK, Scott, thank you very much for that interesting talk. Very, very interesting results. We have uh, some questions. I'm not sure if we have time for all of them, but let's try to start. The, the first question is, uh, does changing the ratio of excited to do inhibitory neuron alter the importance of inhibitory variability? Ah, so, so that's an interesting question. I do not believe so. So there is work from, uh, from another group at UOttawa that has looked at the differing, this sort of asymmetry uh, and basically shown, I believe that it's, it's work from Andre Longton. And I believe that those papers use 500 ex, uh, equal populations of excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And they still characterize the sort of asymmetric effect of heterogeneity in these populations. Uh, obviously the folks of that work wasn't epilepsy, it was a little bit different, but I would, I would strongly uh, believe that that wouldn't affect things. But I would also say that the, this ratio of excitatory to inhibitory neurons is something that's pretty well established uh, is the biophysical reality. Uh, the sort of four to one ratio is the sort of go-to for these EI, cortical EI networks. Um, so I don't think that changing that would be something that we would want to do uh, since we want to sort of maintain that uh, direct connection to the biophysical reality. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question is that uh, you can actually observe stable oscillation in the system because you mentioned the combination of a pair of imaginary eigenvalues and the corresponding real uh, negative eigenvalues. But wouldn't that be representative of a stable focus rather than a stable limit cycle solution? Ah, so, okay, so in terms of if do we actually observe stable oscillations, the answer to that question is quite simply yes. Um, we did a lot of simulations where instead of doing this tonic, this increasing drive, we just gave a tonic input. And if you look at those networks, you can simulate them for long, long periods and you're going to see very stable oscillatory activity. Uh, so that's the answer from the computational side. Um, from the mathematical side, um, yeah, so the, you're, you're right that if we had a sort of, if we had this, you know, a stable oscillator, we're expecting you know, that to sort of cycle down and, and you know, end up at that fixed point in that sort of nice little spiral. Um, the existence of noise in the system, 
uh, prevents that from happening uh, when we sort of actually simulate these things. So yeah, so from a mathematical standpoint, uh, you're right. And again, some of you know those noise elements sort of get averaged out in the mean field analysis. But the correspondence between the mean field analysis and our computational results indicate that yes, what you know, what we're characterizing actually cause oscillatory dynamics in the actual sort of spiking network setting. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, have you thought about using Fitzgunagumo model instead of the Wilson Co. one model so that more interesting dynamics can be found in the spiking network that allow you to do bifurcation analysis without oversimplification? Mm. So, so no, we haven't thought about that. Uh, that would definitely be an interesting an interesting idea. The sort of the motivation behind our use of Wilson Cowan style models uh, was the sort of preservation of the spiking results with the mathematical results. We wanted to maintain this direct connection. And we did that because the sort of Poisson neuron uh, setting with this sigmoidal activation function is something that allows us to very directly simplify and do analysis via the Wilson Cowan. Um, so, so doing so, doing this type of study in the Fitzhugh Nagumo model would be very interesting. Um, again, it, it, but that's sort of not something that we've thought about directly, uh, just because of what our sort of motivation was in maintaining this relationship between the math and the spiking network. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I don't understand the next question, but I'm sure you do. What about bifurcation diagram on the time constant? Um. So I'm assuming the question that this is asking what would happen if we varied the time constant of, Probably, yeah. our, of the model. Our, yeah. of the model. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we did not do that. Again, that is, a, we, we set that and we set that because of, you know, experimental data. Um, so that was something, again, that we, we didn't vary because there was experimental data that constrained our choice of that time constant. Um, I, so I, I can't really speculate as to what that would yield. I would imagine it would yield something interesting, um, but that was sort of because we did have the biophysical constraint motivating that, that wasn't something that we played with. As we add more complexity to this model, uh, something that we're interested in doing is adding in, you know, different interneuron types to a similar type of model. Then we would probably have interneurons with different time constants and maybe we could, you know, we would get into that. It's a little bit more detailed. Okay, and the, the, the next question is related to the analysis of the, of the model. This is from a theoretical point of view. Why is a sudden point bifurcation little to a sudden increase in synchrony? Ah, so this is a great question. So uh, when you, if this was a more mathematically minded or talk, I would have gone more into the, uh, the bifurcation analysis type stuff. So apologies there. Um, but it's sort of, it's well established in the mathematical literature that saddle node bifurcations yield the are basically associated with the onset of synchronous dynamics. Um, so this without, I, I can't really answer this satisfactorily in you know 30 seconds or a minute. Um, but I would say if you look at you know some dynamical systems, you know textbooks or stuff online, I think if we, there's actually a really good Wikipedia page on saddle node bifurcations. Um, but basically, this is a known quality of these this bifurcation mathematically that saddle node bifurcations yield sudden changes in dynamics that typically are associated with oscillatory activity. Um, if you look back at uh, some other previous modeling work in epilepsy, uh, like the epilepter um, from Victor Gerso's group, uh, they looked a lot at these bifurcations and how different bifurcations can correspond with different phases of uh, sort of epilepsy, the onset, the offset of seizures. And what they basically found was that a saddle node bifurcation best explains the onset of hypersynchronous hyperactive dynamics that uh, corresponds with a seizure. So that is something that uh, there's a lot of literature on, uh, and, but, but it, it's pretty well established from a mathematical theoretical perspective that there's this correspondence between a saddle node bifurcation and a strong uptick in synchrony. Okay, we have two more questions. I think we can finish. Uh, Perfect. Say, uh, that it looks like the world doesn't consider the structure of the network like feed forward or recurrent structure. Will those also part of the feature that will affect the dynamic of the problem? Oh, okay. So 
it, it we, we the structure of the network wasn't the focus of our work, but it is a traditional EI network. Even, so it is all to all connected. I should have mentioned that. But there is recurrent connectivity, right? The E cells connect to the I cells, and the I cells connect to the E cells. Um, unless you're unless the reference here is to recurrence uh, structure more in terms of a you know a machine learning artificial neural network style setting. Um, but in terms of an EI network, you're right that this recurrent connectivity is implicated in producing oscillations. Um, a lot of my previous work was looking at ping rhythms. Um, and ping rhythms are basically driven by this E to I, I to E connectivity. But in terms of this question, that is there. Um, that is a major part of these network dynamics, right? That there's a reason that our E to I and I to E connectivities are our strongest connectivities. Um, I would posit based upon how robust this is, that if we weakened the connectivity and made things more sparse, um, if we took away this all to all assumption, we would still see these dynamics. And, and again, the fact that there is this mathematical principle underlying our network structure is pretty strong evidence that this is a more generalizable, robust dynamic that would, you know, hold up to some of these, you know, some of these reductions in our assumptions, like the all-to-all -all connectivity. Okay. Well, just a very quick, if you can respond for the last question, is uh, whether you consider to include the different inhibitory cells? In your yeah. So I, I, I mentioned this brief, uh, previously, yes. So the answer to that is yes, that is something that we, is a major focus of our sort of next steps on this type of research. Um, it, it was a conscious choice to only use one inhibitory population here because that facilitates the reduction of the system and makes the mathematical analysis uh, more amenable to you know numerical study, the fact that we're only looking at a two population model. Um, but yes, this is something that, uh, you know, the Alexander Gwet McCray gave a great talk yesterday, um, showing you know the his cortical uh, network with four uh, cell types, with the VIP cells, the SOM cells, and the PV cells. Our interneurons were basically PV cell like, um, something that we're looking forward to doing. Uh, and since the, you know Alex is a former member of our lab, and uh, the, the Hay Group is a collaborator of ours, we're hoping to sort of start to integrate our stuff together. Um, and add in some of the biological complexity of those different interneuron types uh, to this study of epilepsy. Okay, Scott, thank you very much. We are a bit late already. Thank you very much for this very nice talk and good luck with awesome. your study. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, now we start the, the oral session. We have uh, five uh, orals of 20 minutes each. So the first one is uh, by uh, Oscar Gonzalez, who is a postdoctoral research associate in the School of Medicine, University of California, San Diego. And he's going to talk about prevention of post-traumatic epilepsy through sustained network depolarization. Thank you very much, Oscar. Thank you. Um, and can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, um, cool. So, um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Oscar Gonzalez, a member of the Bajanov Lab, and as you mentioned, at the School of Medicine in UCSD. Um, and today I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing on trying to prevent uh, post traumatic epilepsy uh, using this network, uh, sustained network depolarization. Um, some of this will be a review um, from the last talk, but as already mentioned, uh, epilepsy is one of the most common neurological disorders in the world. It is a term that's used to describe uh, several disorders that are all characterized by these unprovoked, spontaneous, recurrent seizures. Uh, epilepsy has a number of underlying causes. We predominantly focus on traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic epilepsy, but it can also be caused by infection as well as uh, genetic mutations. Um, and as what and was was mentioned earlier, 30% um, of the patients with epilepsy have seizures which are not well controlled with medications. Um, as I mentioned, we focus on TBI-induced epilepsy or post-traumatic epilepsy, which has an, a very interesting kind of progression. Um, so here's a schematic of the timeline for this disorder. Um, it starts with an initial insult to the brain. This can be caused by a severe concussive trauma or a penetrating brain wound. Uh, within hours after the initial insult, we see uh, acute seizures. Um, these are well-controlled with, with medications, 
And the presence of these acute seizures are not indicative of the development of chronic epilepsy. <clears throat> uh, following this acute period, you have this very prolonged period of epileptogenesis, which can last several months to years. Uh, I believe the longest uh, period has been reported was uh, 15 years past the initial uh, brain injury. Um, the mechanisms during this period are not well understood, and so there are no therapies for this uh, time, time frame. And then after this epileptogenic period, you have the development of persistent epilepsy. And as I mentioned earlier, 30% of these cases are drug resistant. Um, in the lab, we can study this uh, in a number of ways. We and the Timothy lab uh, focus on the cortical undercut as our model for um, uh, this post-traumatic epilepsy. So here's a, an example of a cat brain that underwent this procedure. <clears throat> and um, we outline here the region that was undercut over the supercilian gyrus. This is a coronal section showing that the incision is done around layer six of cortex and the perisagittal view showing the extent of the damage. And in this procedure can be done in cats. It's been done in mice as well as in marmosets in the Timofeev lab. And in all those animals, um, within about a month or so of this procedure, they all develop uh, persistent epile epilepsy. So as I mentioned, the mechanisms underlying this epileptogenic period are not well understood. Our lab has done <clears throat> quite a bit of work trying to relate these epileptogenic period back to homeostatic synaptic scaling or synaptic plasticity. Uh, this is a mechanism that was discovered several years ago by Gina Trigiano, um, and it's a bidirectional negative feedback mechanism. The way it works, it's, um, you have some network firing rate, we'll say three hertz as in this example here, um, and you have some perturbation to the network that either decreases or increases your firing rate for some prolonged period of time. Uh, and this results in um, this mechanism will start uh, rescaling synapses, for example, um, in order to, to regain your kind of uh, target firing rate. So it, it, will, it will modify some property of the network in order to do that. Um, and as I already mentioned, the uh, mechanism that is proposed is um, a rescaling of synaptic weights. So if, you, if your network undergoes some type of potentiation, um, it increases your, your network firing rate. Um, over the course of several hours to days, your network will scale back synaptic uh, amp or post, um, post synaptic amper receptor densities so that you can maintain relative differences between synapses. So you can maintain memories, for example, but you can regain network stability. Uh, so in a healthy brain, this mechanism uh, stabilizes um, the dynamics, but we've shown previously in several studies that uh, in the traumatized brain, the scaling mechanism may overcompensate for uh, the lack of activity caused by the trauma and lead to pathological increases in AMPA expression and hyperexcitability and synchrony. Uh, so given that the homeostatic scaling, specifically upregulation, uh, may underlie this epileptogenic period, we ask the question, can we prevent post-traumatic epilepsy or PTE uh, by interfering with this upscaling mechanism of the synaptic weights caused by um, traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> to get at this, we did a combination of um, modeling and in vivo work. I'll focus on the model first. Um, and we published this model several times, so I'll just uh, give a very quick introduction to it. Um, we have two populations of neurons. We have excitatory and inhibitory cells, both modeled with, ho with Hodgkin hexakinetics and have ion concentration dynamics between and within cells. Uh, for simplicity, I'll only show the excitatory cells here. So these cells can form AMPA connections within a local radius, um, and they have these kind of recurrent connections. The strength of those synapses are regulated by this uh, homeostatic rule here, where W is the strength of, the of that connection. Um, the alpha value gives you the homeostatic rate, and then um, we take the difference between the target firing rate, which in this network is five hertz, and um, the network average firing rate. In addition to these connections, each neuron will receive external Poisson input to model afferent inputs from other brain regions. And for trauma, we select the subpopulation of these inputs and reduce their Poisson input by 50%. And then finally, we have an axonal recovery model, um, which basically will recover the, the initial strength of these uh, damaged Poisson inputs um, with, by this um, gamma sin uh, rate, which is incredibly slow. So with this model, we can uh, run these type of simulations where we can um, simulate this cortical undercut. So we have a period prior to trauma where we have healthy activity within the pyramidal cells. So here we have pyramidal cells as a function of time and the color is indicating the voltage. 
Um, so for some period of time prior to the to the, um, the, the the affrontation or the trauma at this red bar, we have spontaneous five hertz firing uh, of the neurons. They look pretty normal and healthy. Um, we apply some trauma, as I mentioned earlier, at this red bar, and we see a transient decrease in the firing rates. Um, if we look down here at panel D, we see that prior to the trauma, we had about five hertz firing rate, and it drops to nearly one hertz. Um, this firing rate gradually recovers as your synaptic weights start to increase, and you see these larger fluctuations in the firing rate. Um, and then eventually, this network will generate these type of spontaneous seizures, um, which are characterized by these periods of asynchronous tonic firing and synchronous uh, polyspike wave bursting. And the mechanism for the spontaneous seizure generation has to do with this positive feedback loop between um, the network firing rate or excitability and oscillations in extracellular potassium. So if we take this, this network as our kind of control undercut case, we can start perturbing it and try to figure out how to prevent these spontaneous seizures. Um, so what we first thought to do was prevent this reduction in the firing rate caused by the trauma. So we apply a depolarization to all the neurons and kind of maintain the firing rate to its baseline level. Um, and in doing so, so we can take this, this network, we apply the same amount of trauma at this red bar, but now we apply this prolonged period of a three millivolt depolarization to the neurons. Um, these distributions here in gray show the voltages prior to trauma and red during the depolarized state. And we see that the activity during that depolarization um, is very similar to what we see in the healthy control cases. And after the depolarization is removed, we actually don't see the development of seizure. Uh, so this model actually prevents, um, th this, inter innervation, uh, this intervention prevents uh, epilepsy and seizures in our model. Uh, we can look at the firing rates and we see that this depolarization is maintaining the firing rate around the target frequency. And so we don't see large increases in synaptic weights um, across this network. And so what we suggest is happening is that by maintaining firing rates, you allow other um, compensatory mechanisms like the external um, recovery to take place and, and, and recover from the trauma, um, but, by, but also circumventing this issue with upregulation. So given that the depolarization um, seems to be preventing epilepsy, we expect that if we hyperpolarize and we do the opposite, uh, it should exacerbate these conditions. Um, and that's exactly what we see in the model. So instead of the depolarization, we apply a three millivolt hyperpolarization. And this actually these um, recurrent seizures uh, forming. And again, they have these uh, stereotyped tonic and uh, polyspike wave bursting. Uh, we can compare the synaptic weights across these uh, three networks that I described. And in red, we have the depolarized case that I showed you just the slide before. Um, and the initial and final weights are pretty similar, so you don't have that kind of pathological increase in weights. But for both the undercut brain in black and the uh, hyperpolarized case I'm showing here, uh, the synaptic weights increase quite a bit, and this is what we believe is driving um, the hyperexcitability in our model. So our model was able to predict, make two predictions, one that the depolarization should prevent epilepsy uh, following traumatic brain injury, and the hyperpolarization should exacerbate it. And um, Luckily, we, we collaborate with the Timofey lab where they can actually do these experiments in vivo. And so they use uh, mice and they do these cortical undercuts in the somatosensory cortex of the mouse and they record from the traumatized area and two adjacent healthy control regions. To apply the sustained excitation or inhibition, they do a local injection of either a GI uh, inhibitory dread or a GQ excitatory dread and they stimulate these um, dread channels uh, chronically for 42 days using a, an osmotic pump. Um, so if we start with the uh, inhibitory dread, so here we have um, the undercut region of cortex is kind of outlined by these arrows, and here we see the local expression of these inhibitory dreads. Uh, within about 12 hours after the uh, cortical undercut, we don't see very much proxismal activity in the um, recording channels, but after about 30 hours, we see these very severe seizure-like events occurring. Um, it should be noted that these seizure events were actually much more severe than just the normal undercut uh, condition, so much so that a number of these mice actually died uh, during uh, these seizure events. So um, here we have kind of a, a validation of our, of our um, prediction that the hyperpolarized case should actually um, exacerbate uh, seizure conditions in cortical undercut models. Um, they also tested whether the depolarization would work. 
And it turns out it does. So if we do the similar type of expression, but now this excitatory dread, and we activate it chronically, we see that um, these are recordings several days after the procedure was done. And we see that the awake state seems pretty normal. There's not really any, aren't very many signatures of proxismal activity. Um, and slow wave sleep and REM sleep all seem to be um, pretty undisturbed. So um, this mouse, uh, these mice actually don't seem to develop any forms of epilepsy. We can compare the number of seizure events across uh, time um, for these different groups. And we see that the undercut animals um, without any other intervention and the hyperpolarized animals both have a significant number of seizure events as time progresses. Um, whereas control animals and these depolarized um, undercut animals um, are statistically indistinguishable from each other. And these controls are cases where we don't have any trauma, we're just doing recordings. So these are nice validations of our model showing that um, we can actually prevent post-traumatic epilepsy by sustained network depolarization um, using, in, in this case, um, dreads. Um, so given these results, we were still interested in understanding the connection between the synaptic weight changes and how they might influence um, firing rate and extracellular potassium fluctuations in our model, which would trigger uh, seizure dynamics. So we can jump back to the model and we can uh, fix uh, the synaptic weights at different values. And we can look at the relationship between the, the um, firing rate fluctuations and fluctuations in potassium. And what we find is that for some region um, or some range of synaptic weights, this kind of dark cone you see um, this in this plot, um, these all are, are indicative of physiologically realistic and healthy, um, uh, very slow fluctuations in these uh, two parameters. And so you get these small rotations within this 3D space. Um, after a certain value of the synaptic weight increases, you actually get the occurrence of these large cycles, uh, which are indicative of seizure events. So given this 3D state space that we've, we've kind of constructed, we can ask where do our previous models, the ones with dynamic synaptic weights, um, where do they exist within this space? Uh, so that we can get a better handle as to what is going on with the, um, this depolarization. And what we see is that the, um, so here, sorry, let me, let me back up. Uh, in black, we show the uh, cortical undercut case where we don't apply any other perturbation. Um, blue is the hyperpolarized network and red is a depolarized. And so what we see is that the black and blue networks um, have increases in synaptic weights into this kind of pathological state, uh, which allows you to have these large cycles within firing rate and um, potassium, uh, which are, as I mentioned, indicative of seizure events. Whereas the depolarized case actually restricts the dynamics of the synaptic weights um, to this kind of healthy region. Um, and we can zoom in on that. And here we show um, these arrows indicate the flow of time. So if they all start in this green spot, um, the undercut and hyperpolarized networks show large decreases in firing rates, which drive increases in synaptic weights through this homeostatic mechanism, driving these large fluctuations and rotations in this 3D state space um, and eventually drive seizure onset. Whereas the depolarized case kind of restricts you to this healthy region. So you don't have these large feedback loops between excitation and, and potassium dynamics um, and you don't develop any seizures. Um, so with that, uh, in summary, we show that uh, sustained network hyperpolarization uh, following cortical trauma uh, exacerbates seizures. These predictions were validated um, in vivo with these inhibitory dread experiments. Uh, we also show that network depolarization can prevent post-traumatic epilepsy. And these were also validated in these excitatory dread conditions in vivo. And finally, we show that the reason this works is because it prevents uh, homeostatic upscaling from driving your synaptic weights into this pathological state and allows other slower compensatory mechanisms to kind of take hold and uh, help you recover from, from the cortical trauma. <clears throat> and uh, with that, I'd like to thank um, the Bajanoff lab, especially Bree, uh, who's a new grad student in the lab who was working on this project with me, uh, Giri Krishnan here, who's a, a project scientist in the lab, and of course, Maxime. I'd also like to thank the, uh, our collaborators in Timothy's lab, Sarah, Sylvan, and Igor for doing the experiments um, to validate the data. I'd like to thank the organizers of this uh, conference for giving me the opportunity to speak today and our funding sources. Uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, Oscar, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, very interesting talk. We have, uh, have time for, there are two questions uh, from the same person. Uh, one is that the, if there are human data like EEG or MEG for what you told. 
um, human data, meaning um, specific to TBI induced epilepsy and, and like stimulation of. Um, I, guess, I guess so. Doesn't say much. Yeah. Um, so there, there's there's a uh, work on EEG uh, looking at these type of things. We focus mostly on um, cat and um, mice models. Uh, but as I mentioned, the uh, Timothy lab has recently started working with undercuts in um, in uh, marmosets, and they still we, they show very similar results um, in those cases. Well, and finally, he asked whether he could have access to the code because he finds it very interesting but difficult to find it where it, it is available in GitHub or anywhere. Yeah, we're we're, we're preparing this manuscript right now, and so it, it will 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 up to one of these. Um, very likely to get hub um, in the near future. Yeah. That's great. Okay, Oscar, thank you very much. Thank very you. And we, we move on with the next talk. Okay. Hi, Richard. Hello. We see you. Yeah, perfect. I Good. already. So my... we have now on the screen uh, Richard Gast. Uh, he is a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Science in Germany, and he's going to talk about on the role of archipelagal and prototypical neurons for neural synchronization in the basal ganglia. So thank you very much, Richard. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to present my research at this very exciting conference. So this work is work that I did together with our external collaborator, Hill Meyer from the University of Twente uh, and different members of the Brain Networks group of our institute. There's Thomas Knösche, the head of the lab. Helmut Schmidt is a postdoc at our group and Rüsche Gong is a last year PhD student as myself. And those here are my funding resources. So this is the structure of today's talk. First, I'll talk about uh, GPE structure and function in general as an introduction. I'll introduce the modeling techniques that I use to investigate GPE dynamics. And then we'll have a look at my results regarding the emergence of neural synchronization in the GPE. And then I'll give you a short conclusion. OK, so let's start out. Um, classic theories of basal ganglia function regard the GPE as a mere relay station along the indirect pathway, which enters the basal ganglia from cortex via the striatum and then goes via the GPE and the SDN to the output structures of the basal ganglia. However, current evidence suggests that the GPE is actually a central inhibitory controller of basal ganglia dynamics. It um, expresses projections to virtually all basal ganglia nuclei and um, also receives input not only from the striatum but also from the STN, from the substantia nigra, from the thalamus and actually even from the cortex. And furthermore, the main cell type in the GPE, the prototypic cells, express a highly heterogeneous but also strong pacemaking activity. You can see here, down here, this is a figure taken from the publication by Dodson and colleagues, 2015 in Neuron, the average firing rates of those neurons. It's quite high at 50 hertz. And you can also see a strong heterogeneity across different individual cells there. Um, actually, similar as in the talk given by Scott on epilepsy in Parkinson's disease, um, this heterogeneity has also been, well, or for a healthy brain, healthy basal ganglia function, this heterogeneity has also been suggested as a desynchronization mechanism. These cells are inhibitory projection cells. They provide projections to many different nuclei. So this makes intuitive sense. But uh, since 2020, we also have some data that supports this hypothesis from Crompy and colleagues published in Nature Communications. You can see um, the, some of their results over here. So they used an animal model of Parkinson's disease. And in Parkinson's disease, um, the basal ganglia show hypersynchronous activity in the beta frequency band. And by optogenetically inhibiting these cells, they found that um, this, these beta oscillations as measured by ECOG were strongly attenuated. 
Um, so clearly the GPE plays a role, or apparently in the generation of these oscillations, some role at least. And one of the main hypotheses uh, on this role is that the recurrent um, feedback loop between the excitatory STN and the inhibitory GPE produce these oscillations. However, in their publication, they did not find that inhibiting the STN also attenuated these oscillations. So we ask ourselves whether the GPE can actually generate beta oscillations as seen in Parkinson's disease autonomously. And one finding that is interesting in, in this regard is that the GPE is actually not a homogeneous neural structure, but that there exist multiple different cell types with different electrophysiological properties and synaptic connectivities. And the second major cell type making up 30% of the total GPE cell count roughly are the archipelidal cells. They have much lower steady state firing rates in comparison to the prototypic cells, which are around 60% of the GPE total neurons. Um, also, there's less heterogeneity across cells in the firing rates apparently, but there is uh, also less regularity in the firing across uh, over time in a single neuron. So we considered a dichotomous GPE structure composed of recurrently coupled prototypic and archipelidal cells and investigated their role in neural synchronization in the basal ganglia. So let's have a look at the model that we used for that. Uh, so we based our modeling work on a recent mean field theory for spiking neural networks. The first work in this regard has been performed by Ott and Antonsen in 2008, was published. So they found that the activity of globally coupled oscillators is confined to a low dimensional manifold and that the equations for this manifold can be derived self-consistently from the microscopic equations under some assumptions. And Montpellier and colleagues uh, yeah, followed a similar ansatz called the Lorentzian ansatz, which actually turns out to be mathematically equivalent to the Otten Thompson ansatz to derive such macroscopic mean field equations for globally coupled heterogeneous quadratic integrate and fire neuron networks. And that is the model that we use, quadratic integrated fire neural networks. Um, the idea for the mean field reduction is depicted here on that slide. So given a QIF network with single neuron observables, such as this membrane potential time trace, or these spiking time traces over here, we are interested in the averaged microscopic observations, such as the average firing rate and the average membrane potential. And using this Lorentzian ansatz, we can derive directly mean field equations from the microscopic equations that provide an exact description of the dynamics of those quantities in the thermodynamic limit. So when the number of neurons goes towards infinity. Um, so this figure is taken from our neural computation publication from last year where we added or extended this theory via different short-term plasticity mechanisms. If you're interested in the mathematics behind the theory and if in different extensions, of that theory, there's a workshop, workshop number seven on the 7th of July, hosted by David Angulo and Matteo De Volo, where lots of excellent speakers will talk about um, these different theories. So check that out if you're interested in that. Okay, so this is the model that we then eventually composed based on that mean field theory. We regard uh, considered this dichotomous GPE structure composed of recurrently coupled prototypical and archipelidal cells. We derived the mean field equations for each of those two populations and connected them synaptically via gamma kernel convolutions and convolutions with bi exponential kernel function of the outgoing firing rates. So this accounts for axonal and synaptic transmission dynamics. Also, we added static inputs from striatum and STN. And this work that I will present now has been now accepted for publication in the Journal of Neuroscience. There's already an early access version um, but should also be published soon, the proof. Okay, so in this publication, I actually refer to a GitHub account where you can find all the code to um, replicate the results in this paper. And for that, you need an additional open source Python package that I developed as part of my PhD. It's called Pirates. You can pip install it or just check out our GitHub webpage and then you should be good to go. All right, so now let's have a look at our results. Um, so uh, as a first step, we'll look at the parameterization of our model. So we 
chose different membrane time constants for the different neuron times and uh, neuron types such that the QIF neuron IO curves, input output curves, resemble published data, uh, namely the data pub, um, presented by Apti and colleagues in the Journal of Neuroscience in 2015. So they show very similar curves for in vitro um, investigations of these different neuron types. Then we adjusted the heterogeneity parameters in our networks, so the heterogeneity in the background input to each population, such that the steady state firing rate distributions in the prototypical population here in purple and the archipelagal population in orange also, again, represent published data. In this case, the distributions that I showed you in the first slide by Dodson and colleagues published in Neuron in 2015. And finally, we um, adjusted and fitted um, the um, four different intrinsic connection parameters of the GPE, as well as the input strengths from Stritum and STN, such that, again, different experimental results on the firing rate changes uh, in response to extrinsic manipulations are accounted for. I'll just give you an example um, of such a manipulation here based on this publication by Aris Tieta and colleagues published in Current Biology this year. So they used optogenetic excitation of the stritum in one of their conditions and found that in comparison to a control condition, the average firing rates of the prototypical cells were strongly decreased, whereas the archipelagal cells here in orange strongly increased their firing rates. And our model in, their, in the default parameterization can resemble those results. Okay, so in the vicinity, or we then applied bifurcation analysis to, to this model. And in the vicinity of this default parameterization, no major phase transitions occurred when we apl uh, applied changes to the average input to the prototypical or archipelagal cell populations. So the average of this background input is given by this parameter eta over here, and the coupling parameters uh, are called k or in, in, in our case. And now we wanted to look at a condition that resembles the Parkinsonian condition. And here we made use of results from Miguel and colleagues published in 2012. And they found that GPE to GPE synapses uh, increased in strength. So the inhibitory postsynaptic currents increased in strength under dopamine depletion, which we took as a proxy for the Parkinsonian condition. And when we increased specifically the self-inhibition of the prototypical cells, we found that we could induce a supercritical Hopf bifurcation in our system from which a uh, stable limit cycle emerged. And this in produced uh, highly synchronized oscillations in our system. However, those oscillations were in a gamma frequency range, 50 to 60 hertz, um, relatively robust to changes in the synaptic time constants, and thus it cannot explain the emergence of beta oscillations uh, in Parkinson's disease. However, these results suggest that still there is a synchronization process going on due to dopamine depletion in the system if it changes these uh, synaptic strengths. And then in the next step, we looked at what this oscillatory regime actually means when beta input, which still has to be somewhere, right? Uh, there is, there are definitely beta oscillations also going on in the basal ganglia and in the cortex, so they will enter the GPE. And we looked at the response of the GPE in this gamma oscillatory regime to better oscillatory input. And as the most likely input source, we chose the stritum and we applied bursty beta oscillatory input to the prototypical cell population, which is the main target of the indirect pathway. Um, and then we calculated the phase amplitude coupling and the phase phase coupling between beta components and gamma components of the GPE intrinsic firing rates using exactly the same methods as described in this publication by Rishi Gong from our group, which he published in Brain in 2020, where we investigated EEG signals of Parkinson's disease patients and healthy controls also using these measurements. So have a look at this publication if you want to know the exact details of how these are calculated. Okay, so on this next slide, you see these results uh, in our model. Um, you can see on the left-hand side the average puck in the system 
for different driver periods, T, and driver amplitudes, so amplitudes and period of the input oscillation uh, on the y-axis here. And on the right-hand side, you can see the correlation between our PAC measures and our PPC measures. And now let's focus on this uh, specific driver configuration over here, number four, which produces this time series here of the GPE firing rates on the right-hand side. Um, and you can see clearly, um, well, in the puck diagram, you can see it's in a region of enhanced puck. And in the time series, you can also see strong amplitude modulations of the prototypical cell firing rates that actually do not have a consistent phase relationship with the input beta. So here in this case, uh, in an enhanced phase amplitude coupling does not go hand in hand with increased phase phase coupling, uh, which is here indicated by this negative correlation um, between PAC and PPC. And this we actually found to be the only GPE regime where this could be the case. So if the GPE was not oscillating by itself already, then enhanced PAC was always um, going hand in hand with enhanced PPC as well. So this is a prediction that we make from our model that if you find PAC measures that um, come without enhanced PPC, then this might uh, then one possibility of generating that in the within the GPE is that it already generates gamma oscillations, the fast oscillations itself. Um, yeah, and actually, so in this publication by Rusha that I showed uh, on our on the previous slide, she found such enhanced PAC measures in Parkinson's disease patients without PPC um, uh, in, well, cortical EEG measurements in humans. So it's a vastly different um, model, of course, or, well, a domain that we model here uh, of the brain, but um, still I'm, we found a very similar thing in our model. And that's basically it from my side. Um, here are my conclusions, just um, four short points. Um, so autonomous oscillations can emerge in networks of prototypical and archipelagal GPE neurons due to increased inhibitory projections of the prototypical cells. These oscillations are in a gamma frequency range, however, and cannot explain the emergence of Parkinsonian beta oscillations, but still assuming that the GPE receives better input in Parkinson's disease, we find that the GPE intrinsic dynamics can lead to better gamma cross-frequency coupling. Thanks a lot for your attention, and now I'm open for your questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, very interesting. Uh, we have one question by, uh, he asked, uh, are there any quantification for the case when the system size is not meeting the requirement of the mean field limit? Meaning that if you consider the finite size effect, finite size effect may be more interesting result will pop out. Yeah, actually, so I did not ask for this question to be asked, but the only backup slide that I brought actually um, <laughs> accounts for this question. Come on, be honest, be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did actually look at finite size effect in our model and look at how well our mean field model still is a good approximation when we actually violate these mean field assumptions that we have all to all coupling and infinitely large populations. So we chose different um, connection probabilities. P1 is 100% all-to-all -all coupling. P2 is 5% of the connections established, which uh, is in, in accordance with experimental approximations of the synaptic connectivity in the GPE. And we also considered a relatively small network size, which is N1 of uh, around a few thousand neurons for each population and around a couple of 10,000 neurons for each population, which is N2. And you can see that, of course, if we have all-to-all -all coupling, then the mean field theory still works pretty well, even if we have relatively low neuron counts, as here in this very upper row. And this is here in a very small dynamic regime, by the way. This is in this strong resonance regime, right, where we have uh, resonant bifurcation. So if you ch change your parameters a tiny bit, you move uh, into a totally different regime sometimes. So this is quite sensitive and it's good that we find that there's this uh, relatively close match between the systems. However, if we 
have a small network and we only have 5% connectivity, then we see that this mean field approximation can break down pretty hard in some cases, especially in this sensitive regime. But if we choose a realistic network size and 10,000s of neurons is very realistic for the GPE, even in the red, then our approximation becomes quite good again. And we can see that we have very similar amplitude modulations in the spiking neural network as we have in the mean field model. But I have a short question by myself. Uh, yeah. If I'm not wrong, you consider all the neurons being identical eh, in the model? No, actually, they are all heterogeneous. So okay. I actually, good. well, I skipped that part about the mean field model uh, because uh, it didn't fit in well when I trained my, uh, tested my time <laughs> for the presentation. But um, so the mean field model considers a continuous distribution in the background excitabilities of all quadratic integrated fire neurons. So each neuron has a slightly different steady state firing rate, or if it's not firing steadily because it's too, uh, the background excitability is too low, then it has a different excitability. So threshold, okay. firing threshold and stable state are further away from each other. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's, uh, thanks again and let's continue with the next speaker. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. Uh, are you going to kick me or should I just close the video? Uh, you can close the video by yourself. Hi, Emil. Hello. Uh, we have the next talk now, which is by um, Emil Mitruk from the Center for Computer Science and Informatic Research at the University of Erfurt in the United Kingdom and he's going to talk about uh, large inter-individual variability of large-scale brain organization in schizophrenia revealed by topological data analysis. Thank you very much for being here. Okay, thank you very for very kind introduction. So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So this work was done uh, together with uh, Professor Volker Stoiber and Dr. Shabnam Kadir at the University of Hertfordshire. And uh, also we cooperated with uh, Dr. Christoph Metzer at the Technische Universität Berlin. And in our work, we addressed the, uh, the scientific question that uh, can topological data analysis tell us something new about the uh, brain connectivity in subjects uh, in people affected by schizophrenia? So. Schizophrenia is a chronic psychiatric disorder that affects more than 21 million people worldwide. And the symptoms range from hallucinations and abolition to cognitive deficits such as impaired working memory. So in uh, neuroscientific literature, we can find that uh, people affected by chronic schizophrenia uh, express reduced connectivity, and especially <clears throat> in the frontal part of the brain, and also uh, in their uh, brain connectivity, it was found uh, that there are some aberrations of default mode uh, network at, as well as in general in the functional networks. So what we see here is that schizophrenia heavily affects the brain connectivity. And that's what we wanted to uh, look into by applying uh, data, topological data analysis. So the data that we are using come from Center of Biomedical Research Excellence in which we had a diffusion tensor imaging as well as structural T1-weighted images for 83 schizophrenia subjects and 91 healthy controls. And as I mentioned, we are interested in the <coughs> uh, brain region connectivity strength. So to achieve that, we had to do some uh, pre-processing and a few steps I listed here. So for the diffusion data, we fit a probabilistic diffusion model and for the atom anatomical images, we defined 94 cortical and subcortical regions according to the automated anatomical atlas. And in the next step, we uh, fit, we use the probabilistic tractography to uh, get a set of matrices of interregion connectivity uh, strength. Unfortunately, this uh, pre processing was not um, successful for all of the data we had at the very beginning. So we ended up with 44, 44 schizophrenia subjects and 44 healthy controls. So 
In neuroscience, it is uh, structural connectivity is quite often analyzed with graph theory and graphs. So graphs are as, uh, defined as a set of vertices and a set of edges that connects those vertices which express some uh, relation. For example, uh, in our structural connectivity setting, we may say that vertices represent brain regions and edges represent uh, and edges connect those regions which are strongly connected. In topological data analysis, we have a bit different building blocks, namely we use n simplicities called cliques, and from those n simplicities we build simplicial complexes. So, in TDA, we call vertices zero simplexes, and we call edges one simplices, and also we have higher dimensional structures, which uh, I show you here, two simplices and three simplices, and from those we can actually create uh, simplicial complexes that we can. <coughs> from which we can infer some topological properties. So for our data, we did the following. For, for each of the matrix that we had, we ordered the values starting by the str uh, strongest connection. So in, our, in my toy example here, I can say that A and B had the strongest connection and uh, regions B and D had the second strongest connection. So this matrix I call an ordered matrix and from this, the next step, I derive the filtration of simplicial complexes. So what I mean by that is that uh, I create a set of simplicial complexes in which every next simplicial complex is created from the previous one by adding an edge to it. So in this example, you can see that I have simplicial complex K0 that has only vertices, zero simplices. And in the first filtration step, I add single edge and you see that I add edge here, which actually was the edge with the strongest connection in my ordered matrix. So then I continue this process and add more edges and until I have fully connected structure. And once I have this filtration, I ask the following question. What uh, independent generators of cycles do I have in this data? So in other words, I am interested in uh, n-dimensional cavities and n-dimensional loops that are formed in this data, like this K4 here. And I also, I'm also i also interested in how much persistent those structures are. So uh, here I have uh, yet another example to explain the barcodes, the way to uh, show you the persistence of the uh, topological properties. So here I have a set of vertices, a set of, yeah, set of vertices on which uh, I, from which I derive the filtration and I present you the topological properties at those barcodes below. So on the x-axis, I have the filtration step, epsilon, and on the y-axis, I have the barcodes. And those barcodes are grouped into zero, one, and two-dimensional barcodes. So for those of you interested in more mathematical details, I could say here that I'm looking for the mth homology group of uh, simplicial complex S, uh, X, but I'll skip the mathematical details and I'll try to give you some uh, uh, intuition behind what we are doing here. So early in the filtration process uh, where we are uh, filtering with the, um, with the uh, brain regions connectivity, which are very uh, strong, we have uh, 10 disjoint components at this stage. So here you see that there are 10 disjoint components and with barcodes of dimension zero, you can see that there are 10 of them. So we have 10 barcodes here. So barcodes of dimension zero tell us how many disjoint components we have in our simplicial complex. So then we grow the filtration, we, in, uh, the, we vary the filtration parameter. And for example, at this stage, we have only five, uh, sorry, six disjoint components. And what else we can see that at this stage, there are two barcodes formed for dimension one. And what does this actually mean is that we have one dimensional loops in this structure. And actually you can see them here. So here is the one, the first one and here's the second one. And what is very important here is uh, how much persistent those cycles are. So actually you can see that this, those two barcodes are very long and we can also see them, see them in this structure here. They are still there. And also there is one more formed represented by this barcode here. And then as we grow, further grow this uh, structure, we can see that this bar, this cycle here is filled in and it's no longer here, there is another one formed. But the cycle here 
is also present here. So this is the idea uh, behind the present homology and uh, represented on the barcodes. And you can actually see that uh, there sometimes there are some higher dimensional structures formed like this H2 means that we have two dimensional uh, cavity formed here, which is actually happening to be uh, here. So a quick wrap up on what we are doing here. So we were interested in uh, the connectivity data from which we derive the filtered complex. And in the next step, we uh, derive the barcodes from it. And in the next few steps, I'll try to give you some interpretation of, of what we've got. So here are our results. So those are the results for cycles of dimension one. And here on the right hand side, I show you how it may look like on a carton example, a one dimensional cycle, how it may look like. And I'd like to uh, explain this figure by starting at the two figures at the bottom. So the X axis on this figure represents all uh, of the unique cycles that we found in this, uh, in this data set. So in all, we had 1,642 unique cycles. And this plot here with the subject index on Y axis represents, uh, shows you the popularity of those cycles. So uh, with uh, blue color, I represent here all the uh, healthy controls in which we found a cycle. And with orange color here, I represent all the uh, schizophrenia subjects with, for whom we found the uh, cycle. And what is very interesting here is that we could find uh, some of the cycles we find for quite a lot of people. And this you can see actually here, there is this uh, agglomeration of uh, points in this area. And this also happened in some other areas like this here or here. So some of the cycles are repeated uh, and shared by quite many subjects in the whole population of the data. Now uh, I'd like to draw your attention here at the bottom. So here we have the barcodes that I just explained. And uh, what we found very interesting is that uh, in those barcodes, we found uh, some uh, patches, uh, areas in which the cycles shared uh, um, topological properties. What I mean by that is that, for example, in the area here for those popular cycles, we see that they are born at quite the same time. They have the same birth time and they have the same lifetime. The barcodes for this group has the same lifetime. And also this was observed for quite a uh, few other groups of cycles. So in general, uh, I will come back a bit and explain this bit a bit more uh, in a few slides, but now I'd like to explain the figure here at the top. So here we present the structure of the cycles, which regions participated in which cycle. So on Y axis, we have a region index for IAL2 uh, Atlas. And if you uh, are wondering why do we have this unusual uh, indexing here, that's because we used uh, Yeo Atlas to group the regions from, uh, with, from the same functional connectivity uh, Atlas uh, together. And then we order the cycles such that similar cycles are grouped together. And we did that by agglomerative clustering and the cluster you see here at the top. So what I mean by the similar structure is that uh, we group together all the cycles that share some regions like here. You see that quite a lot of cycles share this particular region. Or for example, in this area, I see that this region is shared by quite a lot of people. On the other hand, and what we found very interesting is that there is quite a lot of variability in here. So you see that some cycles are very similar, yet there is some there are there is some variability between them. So uh, what we think that is going on here is that uh, something that was reported by Gordon et al. in 2017, and in what they have found is that uh, for the Midnight Scan Club, they found individual brain organization is qualit qualitatively different from group average estimates. So uh, in other words, individuals exhibit distinct brain network topography and topology. What uh, do they mean by that is that if you have a look at this uh, brain parcellation that uh, the average brain parcellation they got from their 10 subjects, you may actually notice that there are some regions in the, uh, for, found in this, uh, some of the subjects like here or here that are not found in the average, uh, the population average. And we hypothesize that that's what we see also with our cycles. 
as I mentioned, uh, I would like to dwell a bit more on the persistent barcodes, but uh, I will present them in a bit different way. So uh, there is yet another way to present barcodes in topological data analysis uh, that is called persistent landscapes. So for every barcode, we create a pyramid like here, and then we level the, uh, set all of those pyramids at the same level. So the information between the persistent landscape and the barcodes is the same, but this uh, representing the persistence information as a landscape gives us the possibility to take the average over the population. And that's what we see here on this example, we have the average. And also uh, we see that those shorter lift uh, barcodes are shown here in the landscape as lower levels of this landscape. So that's what we did for our data. We computed the persistent landscapes for our data sets, and that's what I present you here. On the uh, top of uh, both of the graphs at the top are uh, for the uh, healthy control uh, population, and the, uh, the, both of the graphs at the bottom are for the schizophrenia population. And on the left-hand side, we see that uh, the persistent landscapes for cycles of dimension one. And here we cannot see any significant difference between the two landscapes. They have more or less the same shape. However, if we look at the persistent landscape for dimension two, the average of the population, we see that the, for the healthy control, we have the single peak. While for schizophrenia, we have this double peak, uh, like which, which you can see here. So we think that this, uh, what we see here is that the large scale brain organization is different and more diverse for schizophrenia than for the healthy controls. So uh, I'd like to conclude this talk by uh, saying that what we did is a study of the cycles and we found that uh, many of the cycles are shared am among the subjects in our population, study population. We also observe that uh, the effect of individual variability in the region's connections, and that was reported by Gordon et al. And also what we have observed is that the schizophrenia patients may share many similarities, and that's actually what we think we see with persistent landscape for dimension two, sorry, for dimension one. And on the other hand, for dimension two, we see that the large scale brain organization is different and more diverse for the schizophrenia group. So that's all I'd like, I wanted to present today. So thank you very much for your attention and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Emil. Uh, we have some questions indeed. So let me go through them. Uh, the first question is, uh, what if we consider direct graph, directed graph, the one without symmetry? Since if it is symmetric graph, it is not so interesting because Kev's theory cannot explain it already. Um, so that's an interesting question and actually there, uh, so what I talked about are simplices and simplicial complexes uh, which come from uh, graphs theory but there are also directed simplices and direct uh, complexes and a group in Lausanne actually did the study of uh, uh, micro circuits in the brain, uh, structure of the brain with those. So. Uh, there is a lot of uh, different theory that is devoted to directed simplicial complexes, and it might be very interesting to apply this uh, to the same uh, data set. But unfortunately, we haven't done this, but that's a very interesting uh, view on this subject as well. Okay. Uh, he also asked, or she also asked, uh, also curious, what is the dynamic you predict from the persistent homology? If talk about how the distinct dynamical transit between each other, it will be more interesting. For example, similar work by Pieter Lab in MIT found the ring attractive. What is the new finding in your work comparing to this five lab nature paper roughly in 2018? Uh, yes, so uh, I am aware of the work. So uh, the difference here is that they study the, dy the dynamics and they are interested in the attractors. Uh, and uh, actually, that might be very interesting approach to study what uh, Daniel Bassett was talking about today, uh, the state transition and those attractors. However, here we are uh, studying the, uh, the structure. At this stage, we are studying the uh, connectivity data. Uh, so we were more interested in the, uh, state, in this, uh, the stable state of the uh, data we had, not the transition between different states. Mm -hmm. 
Finally, they say also how this work may connect to the MRI, MRI data of human, meaning that taking geometry into account, what will be different since persistent homology is only considering topology as I understood. So, uh, what is in, what, um, so we skip the whole uh, geometry setting of those simplicial complexes because uh, what we are interested in is just the connectivity strength. So uh, we uh, we take the vertices from the sorry uh, we take the vertices from the geometrical uh, distribution of neural cells in the brain. However, later on in our study, we are only interested in the relation between the regions. We are no, no longer interested in the geometry. And uh, so in our study, uh, we uh, there was also uh, applications of topological data analysis to MRI data, and that's what we are also interested in. And uh, we you, one could analyze fMRI data and study the, fun, uh, the brain uh, <coughs> functional networks with it. And that's also an interesting field that we'd like to explore a bit more. Well, uh, I think there are no more questions. So thanks, Emil, again. And uh, let's, let's move to, to the next talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, we have uh, Jun Jung Moon in the in the last uh, talk this, well, this afternoon for me. And uh, he's um, going to talk about the fluctuations, interregional delays in the human cerebral cortex. So uh, whenever you want, you can start. Hi, um, my voice is good? Yeah, very oh, good. Thank you. And then you see the cursors. I do see, yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'm Jun Young Moon uh, from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, it's great to present here. So this work is about the human ECOP recording, uh, electrocorticography recordings. And what we focus on about uh, what we focus on is about the delays between signals from each channel. Uh, you will find that this is a um, a study about a very general property of the brain communication. So uh, it might have uh, some wide implications to other studies of interregional uh, brain communications. So I will first give you the general overview of the analysis, uh, experimental analysis, and move on to experimental results. And finally, give you a model to gain some insight about the mechanism behind the observed results. So um, uh, our work is mainly uh, motivated by uh, previous works um, from uh, Chapatan et al. and Zhang et al. Uh, Chapatan et al. from um, Jagulur's group at NIH have shown that if you pick a pair of ECOG channels and look at the signals, then there is a characteristic time delay tau which maximizes the correlation between them. So uh, one could give an interpretation that one channel, X in this case, is leading another channel and the information is uh, flowing from maybe X to Y. Uh, also, uh, Zhang et al. from Jacobs Group at Columbia University uh, looked at the delays. As you go further away, uh, from the reference channel. So this is the reference channel. And uh, yeah, so this uh, green, uh, yellow, and the brown, they are the channels that uh, farther away from the reference channel. And if you look at the peak uh, denoted by this red asterisk, you notice that the delays are indeed longer as you go further away. So delays are getting long, uh, longer as you go further away. So it makes sense to interpret this phenomena as traveling wave and a nice uh, directionality map of such traveling waves for entire brain is shown here. 
So um, uh, in general, the, uh, the flow is from um, uh, parietal region, uh, mainly preconeus, to other brain areas. So based upon previous studies, we ask following questions here. Uh, when the information flows in the brain, are the interregional latencies or delay times between different areas of the brain, are they stable over time or do they vary? And if they vary, then how do they vary? So these are the motivations for our study. And to answer these questions, uh, we analyze human ECOG data uh, covering at least one hemisphere of the cortex uh, from 10 subjects. Uh, we play an audio of seven minutes long story twice for each subject and perform uh, the following analysis. So for each channel, we measure, we first measure the correlation between the response from trial one and trial two. So we yeah, gave audit, same auditory stimulus twice and we measure the correlation, response correlation between these trials. And if the correlation is high, it means they are more locked to the auditory stimulus. And if it's low, it means that they are not locked to the auditory stimulus. And as you can predict, the ones uh, in the um, auditory um, areas have higher correlation marked by yellow color. And so we first focused on um, paid, out, paid our attention to these channels first. So what we did was a major, major uh, measure cross correlation between uh, each channel pairs. So uh, basically, uh, yeah, we fix uh, one a signal from one channel, and we move, uh, we give time uh, lag, what, or we fast forward the other channel to the front, what the other direction, and each. At, at each time lag, positive lag, time lag and uh, negative time lag, we measure the correlation. And the, the time lag uh, here denoted as tau, uh, that maximizes the correlation, the cross correlation. We call it, we define that as the uh, latency between channel A and B. So that's our definition of latency. Uh, so for example, here, the, uh, the latency between channel A and B will be 25 milliseconds. And then we can repeat uh, this analysis for all time windows. For, for example, here, the time, time window size is two seconds. So we can perform this uh, cross correlation analysis for all time windows from uh, the point where the audio begins to the point where the audio ends and this is the result shown. Um, so basically what we did is just, you know, turn this cross correlation graph 90 degrees, and this result is one time point in this, um, in this uh, graph, in this figure you see here. So the yellow colors denote the higher uh, value of a cross correlation, and the blue colors denote the lower value of cross correlation, and the black, uh, the black is the, the maximum uh, uh, cross correlation values. And so it will give you the information about the time lag. And as you can see, the time lag is fluctuating as we go from the beginning of the audio to the end of the audio. So based upon this initial result, uh, we performed uh, the following analysis. So now we reordered the time windows in the increasing order of the latency tau. So this is uh, time windows reordered. As you can see, reordered in the order of uh, uh, increasing latency tau. And as you can see, uh, we can um, uh, divide, like we can divide, we can group the time windows uh, with near zero latency as uh, short delay state and the time windows with larger delay state as a longer delay state, larger latencies. So it's nicely divided into two states. And um, actually the black, black asterisk here 
denotes the sentence boundaries between sentence poses and the sentence beginning. So uh, as you can see, the, the longer delay states have more of these sentence poses, which means that uh, the latency increase is more frequent in, in between the sentences where there is no audio. Uh, now we wanted to see what are the characteristics of these two different states. So if, if we, we try to see if there exists any correlation between these delay states and the alpha and broadband power component of the signals. So the blue lines uh, give you the power of alpha power band and the red lines give you the power of a broadband uh, spectrum band uh, from channel A and B. Uh, where the alpha power is defined as the frequency component between uh, 7 to 13 hertz, and the broadband uh, is defined as the frequency component higher than 65 hertz. So as you can see, there is an abundant increase of alpha power, or we can call it alpha power burst, uh, during the long delay states, and there is an increase of broadband power during the short delay stage. In essence, the longer delay and the sentence pauses and the alpha power increase are all correlated with each other. So um, we can calculate the correlation between the alpha power and latency for each channel. And for example, here, the uh, correlation between the latency and alpha power is 0 0.57. And we can repeat that calculation for all channel pairs. Uh, within the nearest uh, neighbors and the next nearest neighbors. So as you can see, so this is the distribution of such correlations, correlations between alpha power and the latency for all uh, uh, 10 participants. And as you can see, there is, it gives you a positively skewed distribution. So if you look at the distribution subject by subject, participant by participant, we see uh, about seven out of 10 subjects ex exhibit such properties. So now we plot the alpha power and latency tau um, averaged for entire time period, so from beginning to the end. So each that gives you the average alpha power and average uh, latency for each channel pair from audio begin to audio end. And we observe that there's also a positive correlation, which means that the channel pairs with higher power in general has longer latencies. So now we move on to the global uh, picture. So if, is this result confined to specific channel pairs or where is it happening? As we, and, and, and as you can see, uh, if we average the time delays between channels uh, from the low alpha power time windows and high alpha top power time windows, you can see, you can pretty clearly see the latency in is increasing over a wide range of areas. And this result is repeated for about eight out of 10 subjects. So in high alpha power time windows, the latency is increasing overall across wide area of, of the brain. So uh, finally, we look at the patterns between two trials. So this is our original figure. Uh, and uh, the time windows is ordered by its latency tau for trial number one. And if we keep this order intact and plot the latency for trial number two, this is how it looks like. So um, at the same time point of audio story in trial number two, the latency is not exactly the same as the trial number one, but it is also not totally different, by which I mean uh, the correlation is there. It's not high, it's not small, it is intermittent in between. Uh, so um, what this means is that the, this latency phenomenon is not purely uh, stimulus driven, but also not purely internal. It is in between. It is partially endogenous and partially exogenous. So in summary, when the information flows in the brain, are the uh, latencies differ from uh, time to time? Yes, they differ, they vary. And how do they vary? 
they vary um, uh, following or correlated with increase of alpha power and decrease of uh, uh, broadband power. And you can see the pattern across many pairs uh, of the brain. So uh, finally, we will end with some uh, modeling results, uh, which uh, gives us insights into this mechanism behind uh, this uh, latency result. So we use a uh, canonical oscillator model, Stuart Landau model, on a structural uh, brain network from diffusive tensor imaging. Stuart Landau model consists of amplitude and phase term for each node, um, and they are connected to each other via structural connections uh, from DTI uh, brain network. Uh, Stuart Landau model can be thought of as a generalization of um, the model. And uh, so this is a, um, a schematic. Oh, sorry. This is a, a schematic. So if given a, a set of all possible oscillators, if we uh, reduce, if we give a first order approximation of these uh, complex um, uh, 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 coupled oscillator systems, uh, they will reduce depending on uh, the type of the bifurcations that they ex exhibit uh, to a canonical uh, oscillator models that has both amplitude and phase term. And if you reduce even further, uh, assuming that the amplitude, amplitude of each oscillator is similar to each other, we finally get a grammar model. So the Stuart Landau model is a canonical model for hope bifurcations. So all the complex oscillator systems, uh, for example, Wilson Quine model that exhibits hope bifurcation, can be approximated by Stuart Landau model. And by studying Stuart Landau model, uh, if we find a specific property in in this model, it suggests that the more general and complex oscillators can possibly yield the same property. Uh, so uh, we already published the um, results from this uh, model, uh, and so you can refer to this paper for further results. So basically, uh, this is a, um, a map. This is the result of the Stuart Landau model on a complex plane, uh, real number and imaginary plane, and uh, the each dot represent each oscillator. So they are, you know, oscillating as uh, in real time. And if we uh, make a projection to X axis, then we can see a nice pattern of oscillations as the time progresses. So uh, if we perform this model on a um, Gong network or consisting of 78 cortical nodes or a Van den Heuvel network consisting of 82 nodes, we observe as we increase the coupling strength, uh, the power of signal increases, and the mean of delay also increases. There is a, a region of coupling strengths where the mean of delay increases. So again, this is a very general property uh, coming from a um, very uh, canonical coupled oscillator model. So uh, why is that? Uh, this is a um, the pattern of uh, uh, this Stuart Landau model, how they oscillate. As we increase the coupling strength S, what you can see is they are more and more locked to each other. So in the beginning, uh, they are going around the circles in random um, initial with random initial conditions. But as the coupling strength is increased, uh, the stable moments between the nodes are increased, and this increase of stable moments results in the increase of latency tau between each node. But if you increase the coupling strength even further, they all lock with each other and they become just one giant um, synchronized uh, sucker. So, uh, so that's why if we increase the coupling strength very far, the latency will decrease eventually. But there is a reason of coupling strength where uh, the delay is increasing as the power is increasing too. 
So uh, I think that uh, simulation that uh, of the model uh, gives you uh, a nice mechanism of why the latency increase is associated with the increase of alpha power. Yes, uh, finally, uh, this work is done in collaboration with Catherine Munich and Charles Schroeder and Christopher Honey, uh, Munich and uh, Honey from Johns Hopkins and uh, Charles Schroeder from uh, Nassen Klein Institute and the data is collected at the University of Toronto. Thank you and please you can address any questions uh, to this uh, email address too. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, uh, did you see any latency between the left and right hemisphere? It seems that they only talk about one side of the brain. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, the problem with the data in our hand is um, the ECOC. Uh, the grid is usually inserted in only one hemisphere. So we were not able to do any analysis between two hemispheres. But uh, we are planning to do analysis on EEG data, which usually has a coverage of entire hemisphere. So I think we will be able to address that question in our future studies. And, and that's a very good question. Oh, I think you are muted. Um, I, I didn't hear, uh, but I think the question is, did I check uh, whether the same result can be produced by the STATA neuron developed by uh, Bad Amantrot? That was the, that question that I see. Uh, um, I am familiar with a few models by uh, Amantrot, but I'm not sure what you mean by STATA neuron. Um, I did check if the result is coming out of the Wilson Quan model. So, and and then so um, the result might be applicable to more complex models. But um, yeah, I didn't check it with the particular data neuron. It might be the it might be possible that that uh, model also exhibits the similar properties, given that the Stuart Lander model is the canonical uh, model of the. Um, Hop bifurcation uh, oscillators. Okay, thank you.